hope I'm going to say this right, Jingari, or hello. I actually did the research on that greeting before I got here, and we had the awesome opening ceremony this morning, so I was actually terrified I was going to say it wrong, and hopefully I've now said it right. So I'm John, uh, as Mel and Liam, Meliam have introduced me, and I am the maintainer, well, one of the maintainers of a little project called RSpec, which I have the pleasure of talking, talking to you about today. So what is RSpec? For those of you in the room that might be new to Ruby or new to Rails, RSpec is a testing library that focuses on more of a descriptive language for tests than some of the traditional test unit style libraries. So rather than uh, a class of test methods as you might find in a test unit, uh, this one just has some trivial setup and then a single test, we have something more like this, which is an RSpec spec. Uh, this, this is Excuse me. The uh, basis for all these specs today are going to be Einstein's theory of relativity, just as a little tiny bonus uh, bit of knowledge for you all. Uh, I had to pick a trivial example, so that's what I went for. <laughs> but what is our spec? Under the hood, on the inside. For starters, our spec is not one single piece, it is not one whole. Our spec is actually several isolated components that fit together into one tool. The RSpec core, which contains most of the basic parts, uh, such as the runner, can, things like configuration, the world, and it allows you to define your examples and example groups. There's RSpec expectations, which contains uh, the matches and expectations set up another little descriptive bits of sugar. There's RSpec mocks which contains all the support for test doubles and stubs and you can use to set expectations on messages passed between objects. And all of these parts can be used together or they can all be used independently. So it's possible to use RSpec core on its own. You can mix RSpec core with shoulda matches. You can use RSpec core with test unit assertions. You can use its RSpec expectations with test unit, go the other way around. You can use RSpec mocks inside test unit. All of these are possible because the um, components are together. So you can even mix the two you know, expectations and mocks from aspects with testing and not use our runner at all, although I've got no idea why you would do that. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> these go on and on and on and on and on into various combinations. But aren't I missing something here? What about aspect rails, I hear you cry? Aspect rails is a bit of an odd one out because aspect rails is not isolated at all. Aspect Rails is in fact a set of uh, conventions for using RSpec with Rails. And you can essentially think of it as the Rails way of testing using RSpec. But what is RSpec on the inside? Let's take a moment here to step inside our sample spec, break it apart, and take a peek about how RSpec actually works. Once again, I have brought back the theory of relativity here, our trivial example. And the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to rewrite this so that it's just an aspect core spec. Not a lot's changed, but basically the syntactic sugar from the expectation has disappeared, and we're instead uh, just failing unless um, E is equal to mc squared. The um, first bit that we do in this spec is we create an example group, class. We're not actually creating an instance here, we're defining a subclass of example group, which RSpec will give the handy name, Einstein's Theory of Relativity, underneath another module. And then we're defining the things inside that class. We're defining some instance methods using a bit of sugar and a bit of magic that's going underneath under the hood to store values for you, but that's essentially what that is. It's now a, a class with a method definition. You, the hooks are a bit more magical. They're not as simple as the test unit style where you just have a method. They are actually registered in a series of things, a bit more like active record callbacks, but they're handy nonetheless. And then we're defining a code block which we're going to be executing during our example execution. If we were to sort of pseudocode this as a class, it would look like this. Don't try this. It will parse, but it will not run. Um, there are some other things that we do, for example, groups that are actually uh, registering them within the internals of our spec. But it is essentially, your essentially, a spec is essentially defining a class like this. 
So if we have our example groups and we've defined them all in our spec files, but how do we actually run them? Well, this is where our spec core comes in. There are several crucial pieces involved in making our spec core work for you. There's the world, the configuration, the reporter and the runner. There's a few more moving parts under the hood, but those four are kind of the sort of main pieces that make it work. The world is an unfortunately unavoidable piece of global state. It basically tracks all of your example groups, uh, other things necessary in the suite like ordering, ordering strategies, filters. It's just one place that we have of storing all together. If you're using Aspect programmatically, uh, you are able to create this yourself and you can actually create new ones, but we just have one singleton one for the command line executable. Uh, the configuration is precisely how it sounds. It holds all of your configuration options, and there are a lot. I tried to count them and gave up. Uh, it is responsible for loading spec files into the world when the time comes, and it is responsible for filtering and selecting stuff. It also sets up your formatters, and it is basically anything you can configure is done through the configuration. It's pretty well named. The reporter is responsible for taking instructions from the runner and passing it along to various interested parties. This is not as nefarious as it sounds, it's mostly just talking to formatters. But we've been trying to encourage people to sort of write their own pieces of code that use the reporter to sort of notify us about lifecycle events. You can sort of think of it as an equivalent to uh, instrumentation within Rails. And the final piece is the runner. Uh, it, the runner <laughs> is invoked when you run the aspect executable. Uh, it basically takes your, creates a world, takes your configuration options, passes them into the configuration, sets everything up, and starts running your example groups. Wait, example groups? I thought we ran examples. Isn't a test an example? I hear you cry. In order to potentially share state across examples or reuse functionality, you need to have some form of shared definition somewhere. In test unit, this is uh, a class that you write and inherit from the base test unit and set up all your methods on. As I've said, we pretty much are doing the same thing, except we are defining classes per test rather than having multiple tests in one class. And after taking the class definition, we basically make each test an instance of the example group. There is actually an, an example that itself does not contain anything about your test. Uh, example is actually responsible for running that piece of code, but it doesn't actually know anything about your specific examples itself. This might sound a bit counterintuitive, but it's just uh, the way that we've chosen to isolate the, the code. So going down the rabbit hole, the runner runs our four suite hooks. It then talks to, it sets up our example groups. It then runs the example groups. Example groups run your before group or before context filters. Sets up examples to run your before each example hooks, which then takes an instance of example group, finally runs your code block, and processes the result. This is just a small fraction of what it takes to run <laughs> your example block. Uh, we have a few bits and pieces we have to catch and rescue in order to make sure that we don't crash when we're running your tests, because the point of the test is to break, right? Um, my favorite part of this is uh, all exceptions excluding dangerous ones that Ruby's on Ruby's that allow it. It's basically l uh, a subclass of exception that limits a few things so that it safely rescues things. It's, it's, it's weird. <laughs> Um, and then so after that, we basically bubble back up the rabbit hole, looking at all of the um, hooks on the way out, all the way back to the runner, which finally closes down, processes all your port and your format has spit out all your output. So at this point, you're probably thinking, why, oh, why didn't I take the blue pill? I didn't want to know any of this stuff. But I'm going to carry on regardless. To recap here, when you're writing a spec, you're actually writing a hierarchy of example group class definitions. So it's important to note that your sub, describe, and context blocks are actually further subclasses of your parent example groups. That's how we isolate the behavior. We actually just use Ruby's inheritance. It's quite a nice little way to isolate it all. But why would I do this? Wouldn't it just be simpler to follow the testing approach and just write proper classes? After all, that's just Ruby. Well, in part, it's because of Aspect's history with the behavior-driven development movement. So it's more in keeping with our philosophy to have readable specs. 
but it's also because it allows us to have more control over example groups and how they are defined and managed. As we, if we think of it back to the pseudocode slide, there wasn't anything involved in registering that, but RSpec does a lot of work to sort of store that, filter them all, and it allows you to define metadata, to categorize them, to filter, to do conditional stuff. And at the end of the day, it is just Ruby underneath. You're still writing a class, it's just that we're giving you a way to write that in a nicer way that actually ties into our feature set. But it means that when you're actually writing specs and you want to modify something in the way RSpec does something, you can just use Ruby. The simplest way is simply to run and include. Take a module, put it into your spec, you can add any additional features you might want within those examples. In this case, I've wrapped up the fail unless into a prove method. And so I've got to, you know, just shortcutting a few steps. And because these are all registered with our spec, we can do this for all of our example groups if we choose to, and what subset of example groups we choose to. But what about the content inside the block? What about those little niceties with the expect syntax? This is where our next gem comes in. This is where our spec expectations takes over. So going back to our example, how do we turn this back into this? First off, there's a couple of p moving pieces with expectations. The expect syntax is what's being used here, so it's actually creating an expect target. The older should style syntax does something very similar. It's pretty much the same code under the hood. But the expectation target is what's actually running your expectation for you. It's saying, does this value match this thing? And the thing on the outside is what we call a matcher. And that's what's representing our, our value here. It's important that matchers themselves never raise, because if they never, if they um, tried to raise themselves, what would happen is you wouldn't be able to negate things. So the expectation target is actually just checking, running all of that. And it does this using the matcher protocol. This is another, sorry, extract <laughs> from inside our code. But it's important, the important part is basically, it comes down to two primary methods that you must implement. One is matches, which is also sometimes um, aliased as triple equals. And the other one is just a, a message for us to print out when it fails. So it's mostly just formatting in sugar. Uh, the key, there's one method that actually allows you to def define a matcher. Now, some of you may have written your own matches and be, may be familiar with the DSL that we provide you to write matches. So this one, I've sort of wrapped up our little theory into a, a matcher, and I'm expecting E to equal MT squared again. But again, this is just syntactic sugar for defining classes. That this is the equivalent of writing this. It's just Ruby. We can equally use this on its own. So how about RSpec mocks? How does that fit into this? Well, first off, I ask you to remember that RSpec mocks can also be used as a standalone library. This means that we have to integrate it into RSpec as if any other third party is integrating it into. So it creates its own expectation target on its own. This is a bit weird in that it doesn't rely on aspect expectations to run its own expectations. But it doesn't actually work the same way. It's actually only supporting the aspect mocks matches. The reason for this is because we wanted to be able to run things separately, and we don't actually want to import all of expectations if you just want to use mocks. But the matcher, we're using the same matcher protocol to define how we set up expectations. So it's again, equivalent to uh, creating a matcher for receive, but it's actually it's a bit weird because it doesn't actually set up, uh, and it doesn't actually assert directly. If you were just to have this, you would never actually fail this test because it would set up an expectation and it would never be checked because it's just, it's just running through the code procedurally like it would do in any other piece of Ruby. So how does it work? Although Mox and Core are two separate pieces of software, they kind of do need to know about each other in this particular instance. And we could have implemented this two ways. One way is we could have used the before and after hooks that we set up, that we talked about earlier. But we didn't go down that route. We instead gave RSpec Core a protocol for handling any mocking framework. It's not a very sophisticated protocol. It basically just has a setup, a teardown, and a verify. But anything that implements that particular pattern can be used with RSpec to, as a mocking library. We actually use, we have all these adapters in RSpec Core for using various other mocking libraries within, with, as well as our own. And it basically just uh, sets when you, uh, sorry. When you finished, uh, before all of your hooks are run, it calls setup. It, which uh, registers a few things, traps all your various um, 
uh, expectations. And then when you run your test, afterwards we call verify, which checks all of those expectations have been made, and tear down is just a cleanup. Uh, so, and moving on again, although I did mention uh, that aspect Rails was basically just a set of conventions and uh, most of it was actually been done by Rails, I thought it might be nice just to talk about how we actually use um, aspect and Rails together here. We actually use our own inclusion feature. So we are, we are actually extending aspect ourselves using our own APIs here to give you the Rails functionality within aspect. Um, the, well, this is just a, a sample uh, example group. It's basically just mixing in all of the various uh, Rails test helpers into a request spec in this case. But we're actually just hooking that all back into our spec using our own public APIs. This isn't what I mean about our spec Rails being a very thin wrapper around its own, around the Rails test helpers. So some of the matches we actually include are um, only part are only wrappers around Rails' own sort of assertion code. It's like it's all uh, using the sort of protocols we've outlined. It's possible to do almost anything. So we just took Rails' own uh, assertions and wrapped them with our matcher protocol, and suddenly you're able to make um, expectations against Rails apps. Most of the heavy work is done by Rails. So to sort of recap here. The isolated components that make up our spec, core, mocks, and expectations, can be taken apart, put together, and basically are just defining a set of Ruby classes and that are running your specs. And that's actually, I've run out of slides. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, any questions? That's probably went really fast. You were really fast. You're like 15 minutes early, so we have plenty of time to talk about it. Um, anyone? I'm sure everybody uses Aspect. It's probably gone straight. There must be lots of things you want to ask John. It doesn't have to be related to his talk. <laughs> I'm just putting on the spot here. This is uh, possibly slightly an aside. Was the should to expect syntax change just about being less invasive to sort of all sorts of core Ruby objects? or The should versus expect syntax change. Um, so the question is what? Sorry, can you repeat the question? What's the main reason for that syntax change to be less invasive of you know, inserting should methods everywhere so that um, uh, the code would read as it did? To, uh, so the question was, uh, was the should to expect syntax change to make it less invasive so that should isn't put everywhere? The, there's two reasons why we changed the syntax. The first is it, we did want to stop monkey patching. So we did want to make it less invasive, not overwriting the method definitions. The second was actually to fix a bug with aspect rails. Uh, there's a particular set of circumstances where active record proxy objects, which are associations, will completely overwrite their own original definitions and completely clubber should, because they doesn't know about it, so doesn't redefine it. So that bug report started the momentum, and then we decided to remove monkey patching from everywhere because it's just a better way of designing software. No other questions? Yes, we have one over here. Oh, one over there. Hi, uh, I love Aspect. I use it every day. Um, and from my perspective, as I'm using it, there's really not much more you could add to make it better for me. But I'm wondering, like, what does the what does Aspect like six look like? Like, is there a, a future that I could not possibly imagine that's so awesome that it's going to be amazing? So the, summarizing the question, what would an aspect six look like? Is there something lined up for the future? Or um, we have vague plans for the future, but they are vague. Um, the biggest change would probably be we want to drop some Ruby support, but we can't do that until everyone is ready for us to drop things like 187. Um, when Bundler and things like that start to drop Rubies is when we start to think about it because it's quite hard to start supporting things without Bundler these days. Uh, at that point, uh, we'd really like to remove all the 187 support from Aspect 4. Um, the biggest thing on the roadmap at the moment is Rails 5 support. Uh, there's a beta out with that, thanks to Sam Pippin. Um, Rail Aspect 3.5 is basically going to be a release geared towards supporting Rails 5. The future. <laughs> Someone else. Yes, making it hard. 
That's okay. There's two mics. Oh, oh, he's here. It's the other half of Melium. Hurrah! That uh, nice decoupled design that you just showed us, was that something that was planned from the beginning or is it uh, refactoring that the team did later on? It was a ref uh, sorry, the question is, is the nice decoupled design uh, the original design or was it a refactoring? It was, it's a bit of both. Um, the original aspect was essentially uh, a prototype. A lot of it was thrown away between aspect one and two. So there was an original, there was a design that came around in aspect two that was thought out and planned but it was basically a rewrite of the entire thing. Yep. Easy. Uh, so similar to should in, in, the, in the should or sy should syntax, are, are there features that, um, or methods that get used, patterns that you use currently that you wish we'd stop using? So the question is, are there any uh, patterns that I wish you would stop using? And the answer is yes. It's any instance, please stop using it. Who's guilty? Oh, John. Get in the hand. It's not the only way. All right, uh, have a someone uh, shouted out why. Okay, so the reasoning is, is it's actually a really difficult piece of code to maintain and it's actually kind of ambiguous in how it defines things. A lot of people say, well, doesn't it refer to any instance? Well, it doesn't. It refers to any one specific instance. So what happens when you try to have multiple instances of the same thing? It's actually quite hard to express grammatically and it's also really hard to try and implement and try and guess what you mean. Anything that's ambiguous is hard to write code for. And also because it just tramples all over Gob State, monkey patching, blah, blah. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So what do you suggest that people use instead? Stub out the, the new call for classes or? So the question is what do people suggest to do instead? Uh, I suggest two things. One is stubbing out new. Um, I don't like to suggest that, but it is one way. Uh, it's. I, what I'd first suggest is that uh, the code is refactored so that collaborators are yeah, passed in to the code under test. This means that you can replace it with a normal double without knowing anything about a particular object. Or something that behaves like that object. It doesn't have to be the same thing. There's a mic coming. You have a mic slide. Is the subject intended to be the object under test or the method currently being described? <laughs> so the question is, is the subject supposed to be uh, the object under test or the method under test? Um, first off, that requires uh, you to think whether w what you mean by subject. Well, there is, of course, the, the memo, I, a specific named uh, let variable called subject. I prefer you don't use that um, because it's ambiguous as to what you mean. <laughs> what is subject? I am studying subject. I am testing subject. What is that? Why not give it a name? That would be my first criticism. And the second is, um, again, because of that ambiguity, it's like, is the class, isn't the method? Well, if you give it something specific, then you know what it is. I personally would say that it's a method, but that's not what aspect does because, of, as I said, subject, or, subject actually was uh, built into aspect to support one line expectations from Shudder originally. And it's kind of, I, I don't like it. <laughs> All right, can people keep their hands up just so that we can circle? Uh, first off, thanks for that because now I can tell people stop using subject because John says. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but second, I was curious if you have any plan or if you know of any plans to sort of uh, support um, either asynchronous or concurrent example runs uh, as part of our spec. So the question is, uh, are there any plans to support uh, asynchronous example runs within our spec? Um, not directly. Uh, we've done some work on improving the thread safety of various parts so that it can be done. Because you can actually you can actually decompose the runner, replace the runner with your own one that actually runs it in parallel. It is possible to do. There are a couple of gems that do it. At the moment, our approach is kind of to prefer that third parties continue to do that. 
They may one day be an aspect uh, asynchronous or something, but we're focusing on maintaining what we've got, and we encourage others, and we actually, we, we go and help. If someone says, I've got a problem trying to do this, we actually go, do go and help them to do it, but we're not planning to bring it in as a core feature anytime soon. Um, given we've got so much time, you know, it's probably a little bit of a silly question, but I was wondering what your opinion of mini-test was. And you probably don't need to repeat the question because we've got mics. Leave him alone. He's nervous. Uh, my opinion of mini-test is it's a perfectly usable piece of code, but it's not my preference. Do we have any more questions? Or any more trolls? Right. I've got one. <laughs> so in what scenarios would you recommend people don't use RSpec and use something like Cucumber instead? Um, use something like Cucumber instead? Um, personally, I don't have any anymore. Uh, I used to write Cucumber for my Rails projects, but I decided that it was actually better just to write RSpec. I have no particular reasoning why, it's just clients don't read them. Okay, I think. Um, oh. I was just wondering how RSpec is tested. RSpec is tested using RSpec. <laughs> and Cucumber. <laughs> In that case, a, a Cucumber actually does serve a valuable purpose because it also serves as our more readable documentation. Uh, we actually publish it all up to Relish App, and it actually contains specific examples and markdown describing what's going on. The actual fact that the scenarios are in those is actually kind of irrelevant because most of the usable documentation is in the first half of the file. And the scenarios are just examples. And because they're executed, they're checked, and therefore they work. So it's like a nice way of making sure our documentation doesn't fall out of line with what actually works. Um, hello. Hi. I'm over here. I'm over here. There we go. Just, just, just sort of wave when you actually start speaking. It's actually quite um, difficult to see who's holding the microphone. <laughs> One question that's slightly out of date. Uh, you know, I work on a lot of different teams, and we have, uh, there's always holy wars about the syntax or the style we should be using. Uh, I'm a real fan of like the let style approach to defining things you need for your test. And there was, but there was a huge backlash at my job to like get everything in the actual uh, expectation and set everything up there, which I, I find kind of stupid. So I don't know how you, I think you know how I feel about it. <laughs> I'm just wondering how you might feel about it. It depends on what the test is trying to describe. If something is important to, the, to making the test readable, I'd probably put it in the uh, block. If it's just a case of I'm performing some setup, I need some values, then that's what let's for. Um, yeah, it's a whatever sort of fits your needs really. If you, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of repeating large amounts of setup just to put them in the in the expectation block. Does that help? Yeah. How do shared examples work under the hood? They, they register themselves within a, a registry, and then they are basically the blocks are evaluated in terms of the class. So it's basically Repeat, taking, it's like taking, defining your examples inside a proc and then running that in multiple example groups. It's just a way of registering them and storing them and bringing them back. So it's pretty similar. To, it's basically module exec under the hood. Um, so I've spoken to you about your opinions on better specs in the past. Um, and you could possibly share your opinions on that with the audience, but um, does the RSpec sort of uh, core group uh, publish any of their own recommendations on how to write specs uh, sort of in an equivalent fashion, and where can they be found? Unfortunately, we don't, um, because none of us have sat down to write them. Uh, I know that one of the um, team members is working on a book which might help with that. Uh, I'm not sure when it's being released, but Myron's been working on it for a while, and that might help illuminate matters, but 
none of us are really proficient writers. We find it hard enough to write the blog posts. Okay. So this kind of relates to uh, two topics. One of them has to do with uh, this being similar to Rails, like a, a core at a core tool for many of the people in the world writing applications and software. So as a maintainer at that level, my question centers around, is there any message that you want to impart to those who use it, ways to help support the cause above and beyond, you know, submitting patches, the stuff we hear a lot. Are there things that aren't necessarily said that would help benefit the cause above and beyond just using it and, you know, giving opinions? I guess my answer to that would be any report is useful. Uh, we can't fix things we don't know about. But search the issues first, because we get quite a lot of repeat issues. Like, and some, um, it's, it's easy to be able to close and just say, yes, this was fixed in that. But it's, you know, it takes up time. But still, I think we'd still rather people just report things that they find, like, even if they don't do the searches. Probably to have better to have more noise than less. I mean, there's nothing there. Yeah. You said you were encouraging people to use reporters or create their own. What's an example of something cool you could do with that? Sorry, could you? Reporters? You said you were trying to encourage people to implement or use their own reporters? Um, so it's one of the places where things that tend to use us, but tend to try to extend... No. We've had a couple of instances of a place people monkey patch our own system rather than just writing their own reporter. That's why I, I say that, because it's like, if we give you this API, please use it. Uh, my favorite one is actually the one I produced as a hack for RubyConf two years ago, which was basically, it deleted any code that failed your tests. <laughs> hey, it's one way to get a green test suite. <laughs> Not I recommended. Think, I think that's it. Thank you so much, John. Thanks, John.